Good morning. The first scripture lesson for today is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words of wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I came to you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet, among mature, we do speak wisdom, though it is not wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are doomed to perish. But we speak God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, no eye has seen nor ear heard, nor human heart conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Sometimes in the course of a week, what you planned on preaching and your scripture you picked out changes because of circumstances, as it did this week. So I'm changing my second reading. It will be coming from the second chapter of the book of Isaiah, verses 2 through 4. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. 
Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction in the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. All thanks and praise be to God who gives us his word, that we may find our direction, guidance, and hope in this world and forevermore. Amen. This past Wednesday and Thursday, I had to do a quick in and out to New York City. It's cold in New York, by the way. And I flew in to Newark Airport. I stayed with some friends in northern New Jersey, and then Thursday drove into Manhattan Island uh, to go to a Presbyterian Church USA meeting. It just so happens that across the street from the United Nations building is the United Nations Church building, and all the major denominations uh, that have ministries at the UN have their offices in the office across the street. So out of northern Jersey, we took the ferry and we went up and uh, as you know, the UN is up near the financial district in Manhattan. And uh, we took the ferry, we got out and we were only about a five block walk from the UN church building. And as we were walking, uh, I saw something that I didn't even know was there. This is called the Isaiah Wall. It is right across the street from the United Nations building. The Isaiah Wall is one of the monuments in Ralph Bunch Memorial Park. And Ralph Bunch was the first African-American Nobel Peace Prize winner and is also known for his peacemaking work uh, and civil rights work, not only in the United States, but across the world. And so as we were walking towards the church building, there it was. And, I, and, and the people I was with, I was with five or six people, and I stopped and I said, wow, I didn't even know that was there. And they all looked at me like I was dumb. And, um, and I said, well, I got to get my picture in front of that. So here we go. There I am standing. In, you, as you can see, I'm cold, okay? But but uh, as you can see, I'm standing right under Isaiah's name. And that's how I started my day. As I'm heading into an ecclesiastical Presbyterian type meeting, the first thing that I encounter is the Isaiah wall with that passage that I just read from you. Now, I just told you how I started the day. Meeting went fine. Don't need to tell you anything about that. Um, but let me tell you how I finished my day before I had to fly out of Newark that night. Let me show you. The people I was staying with said, have you seen the, have you seen the uh, memorial at the World Trade Center? And I said, no, I never have. They said, well, we're taking you down there. You can catch a cab from there. So we went down to the memorial park at the World Trade Center. Of course, there's that grand building that has been built that you can see in the skyline of New York now that memorializes uh, those who perished on 9-11-2001. So this was how I was finishing my day. You know, I, I remember exactly as many of you do too. I remember exactly where I was on September 11th, 2001. We were just starting a staff meeting at the church in Palm Coast, Florida, when one of our staffers came in and said, funny thing, I just heard on the news that a plane hit a tower, one of the towers of the World Trade Center. And we all sat around the table thinking, what was, what was that pilot doing? Then a member a little later poked his head in and said another plane had hit the other tower and we knew immediately what was going on. We adjourned the meeting. Our associate pastor lived about four houses down from the church and we went to her house to watch the coverage. Another picture. This is one of the footprints of one of those mighty buildings that came down. And when you look in, there's water flowing into that center square. That's 
That's an endless hole that the water pours into, um, commemorating the hole into which those who perished had fallen. There are two of those like that. The footprint of each building is memorialized in that way. It's a quiet place, contemplative place. It's a, it's a sacred, worshipful place. You feel worshipful being there. And, and there's a sense of peace and quiet, which is strange when you think back to the hellhole it was on that fateful day. Next picture. And around each of those uh, footprints of the original World Trade Towers are the names all the way around of those who perished etched in stone around the memorial. You know, I often think that, can't help but think, as I think of the Isaiah passage, that every day since that day, we, our nation, and to a great extent, our world, has been in a perpetual state of war. Hear these words again. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I, all I thought I was doing when I went to New York and I was wanting to get in and out as fast as I could, all I thought I was doing was going to an ecclesiastical meeting. What I didn't know is that I was going to encounter that wall with that Isaiah passage on it first thing in the day. And what I didn't anticipate until we had lunch and they told me they were going to bring me to the World Trade Center to see the memorial. I didn't know I was going to start my day and end my day in that fashion. It's often serendipity. And I knew at that moment my sermon this Sunday is going to be a little different than I had planned. And I think about that passage of Isaiah, that ancient passage, crying out for peace, crying out for the peace that God gives to us. And I got to ask, knowing what I know in this world, in my life, I got to ask, Isaiah, when is this going to happen? When you spoke these words, did you have a time frame in mind? And I got to ask, God, when is this going to happen? When you gave these words to Isaiah, did you have a time frame in mind? All I was planning to do, God, was to go to a church meeting. And then Isaiah confronted me. And then Ground Zero confronted me. And then, there was this. This is the new travel center at the World Trade Center Memorial. You go in that building, it's amazing. It is, I mean, subways come in, trains coming in, it's, it's, it's high-tech building. There's a mall in there, and they built it so that it looks like the wings of a bird are rising up over once, where there was once great tragedy. It's, it's an awesome sight to be there and see that. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul spoke of hope arising up out of tragedy. And the first thing he needed to say to the Corinthians, and he's going to have to bring the Corinthians to task for many things that they are failing to do and causing division in their midst. But first, Paul wanted to speak about hope arising out of tragedy. And this is what he says about this. I did not come to you proclaiming the mystery of God in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified and I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He's addressing a church that's in great division, great turmoil. They're in spiritual war against each other in many respects. 
You know, when I think about being at the World Trade Center Memorial, that happened 17 years ago, almost 20 years ago now. And I think about Paul's words to the Corinthians. Timing-wise, Paul wrote these words about 20 years after the crucifixion. Feelings-wise, what he felt in contemplating the death, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, is no different than the feelings that we have felt in the wake of 9-11. For tragedy brings the same feelings forward in our own lives. And what Paul was feeling about the crucifixion even 20 years later is what we all feel when we see those pictures and we remember that date and recall how painfully tragic it was. To some degree, whoever we are, we are a people who face tragedy and who walk in fear and trembling as Paul speaks about it to the Corinthians so long ago. Because our world has changed and sometimes we don't think we can hardly understand what it all means. So I'm there at that Trade Center Memorial and I'm thinking to myself while I'm there, in just a few hours, I'm going to climb aboard an airliner. But not before. I have to go through that whole security thing, and trust me, in Newark Airport, that security thing is something else. Not before I have to go through that whole security thing. And I remember a day before 9-11-2001 when I didn't have to do that. Remember the days when you could go into an airport, walk straight to the gate and get on and your family could come with you and you went straight to the gate and you got on the plane and it seems like, my God, I didn't know peace when I saw it. If we think about it, these lives are fragile things, unpredictable things. We, we try not to think about it. But trust me, you don't go to the World Trade Center Memorial knowing you're going to get on a plane in a couple hours and not think about it all over again, how fragile we are. And Paul may have well said to the Corinthians that day, it was only 20 years ago, that our Savior, whom God had sent to us to bring hope, was crucified by this world. Have we changed much? No. I'm afraid not. Jesus came and died, and yet he was raised up by God, and we know that plowshares have not become swords. I mean, have not, swords have not become plowshares yet. 9-11 came and went. A memorial now stands there. But spears have not turned into pruning hooks yet. Paul was telling the Corinthians that although they were 20 years out from the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, they were still inextricably connected. No Corinthian had been there at the crucifixion. They were living in Greece. Paul had not even been there himself. Yet even so, the moment still speaks deeply to the human struggle. Isaiah did say, swords will be plowshares. Spears will be pruning hooks. Jesus said he would return and bring the kingdom of peace. And we still wait. Faithfully, sometimes not so faithfully. The question is, how shall we wait? And on whose authority do we wait? This Thursday in our fellowship hall, 
We're having an event put on by the Interfaith Organization in Lee County. And I was asked to speak on a panel about the Jerusalem question. The imam of a local mosque is the one who asked me to be on the panel. And at a weak moment, I said yes. And then I saw a publicized flyer about who was going to be on the panel. And I said to myself, I don't want to do that. I know where some of these people stand on these issues. I don't want to do that. So I sent an email to the imam. And I said, I regret this, but I am going to decline the invitation to serve on the panel. I immediately got a phone call. And I, I was having coffee with them last Monday morning as a result of that phone call. And face to face in his office, I again told him, I didn't want to do it. I, misunderstand, I misunderstood when he first asked. It's my fault, but I really don't feel doing it. I don't, don't feel I can do it because it will make me too uncomfortable. And he said, the imam, the local Islamic imam, he said to me, so am I. I'm uncomfortable too. But doesn't peacemaking demand it? Remember last week I told you how I hate when people who have a better thinking process than I do about something causes me to change my mind? So I asked for another cup of his wonderful Turkish coffee. And I said, okay, Muhammad, I will do it. I don't know what I'm going to say. I'm going to go there still not wanting to be on the panel, but I'm going because it's uncomfortable and Muhammad is right. And Muhammad taught me something about Isaiah. God isn't turning swords into plowshares, spears into pruning hooks, but rather God is expecting that we are the ones who are supposed to. Amen.